Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. As we gather here in this beautiful day that God has given us, <clears throat> as we gather here in the pews and with those who join us via our live stream today, as we come together this morning, may we know the amazing grace of God and of deep wells of love and joy that come from worshiping God and can be taken in to go with us in our week ahead. So now may we turn our hearts and our minds and our spirits to the worship of God. Once there was a man who did such amazing things and who said such wonderful things that people followed him to a well and he said to them, if you drink the water from this well, you will be thirsty again. But the water I will give you will be a wellspring of eternal life. Let us worship God. The call to worship. Jesus says to us, anyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water Christ gives us will never be thirsty. The water that Christ gives us will become a spring of water, a spring gushing up to eternal life. We come before Christ asking for this living water so we may never be thirsty again. Jesus says we will be fed when we do the will of God. For the fields are ripe for the harvest, and we are sent forth, entering into the labor of God. Come, let us worship God, who has called us to this work. Oh 
prayer. Son of Mary, have mercy on us. Carpenter of Nazareth, have mercy on us. Healer of the sick, have mercy on us. Bringer of good news, have mercy on us. Savior of the poor, have mercy on us. Disturber of the mighty, have mercy on us. Contradictor of the smooth, have mercy on us. Destroyer of false religion, have mercy on us. You who moves towards Jerusalem, trailing hope behind you, have mercy on us. You who calls us to come with you, have mercy on us. Siblings in Christ, this is the good news. Through Christ, the dividing walls have been broken down. We have been handed a hope that we can live our lives in new ways. Such a gift surely sets us free. We are free, and we will rise as God's freely chosen ones, shining forth in the world with love. You probably can't see this very well, but it should be coming up on the screen. Anybody know what it is? It, I heard it over there. It's the Charles River watershed. And you'll notice Foxborough is down here. And you see all of the water that connects us. Years ago, I was working at a church in Milton, and I drove past a sign that said, Welcome to the Charles River Watershed, Communities Connected by Water. And I thought about that. I've thought about it ever since. Because isn't that who we are as baptized people? We're members of a community that is called together by water. So, we're going to not play a game, but water, as we will hear in the Gospel story in a minute, and as we've already heard alluded to, the story of the woman at the well with the water of everlasting life. So that water is in the baptismal water. What other water can you think of, water stories? The wedding at Cana. The wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns water into wine. So that story connects us in the water. There are lots of water stories. John the Baptist, who baptizes Jesus in the water. So we'll pour that story in. How about in the beginning? The Holy Spirit moved over the waters. So that story is in our baptismal water. Any other stories you can think of? Fishermen. Fishermen. Jesus calls the fishermen to follow him and become disciples, and he fishes with them in their boat, and he takes them out, and their boat is in a storm. So those stories are in the water. Okay, there are two big ones. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark, the flood. So this is the water of the flood. One more story in the, bapt in the baptismal water. Walking on water, Jesus walks on the water. And that water is in the story. What did Moses do? Parted the water. This is the water of the Exodus. So that story goes in here. 
all of this water is present in the water that we were baptized in. And because we are communities connected by water, all those stories belong to us. They're part of who we are in the water, through the water. So I think about those stories and how important water is to the people of God to tell their story as we listen today to the story of the woman at the well. Amen. Lord, come and save us. 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 The Lord God keeps faith forever, secures justice for the oppressed, gives food for the hungry. The Lord sets captives free. Lord, come and save us. 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 The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord raises up those that are bowed down. The Lord loves the just. The Lord protects strangers. The Lord, come and save us. Lord, come and save us. The Lord, come and save us. The word of God that greets us this morning comes from the gospel according to John, and I read from chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came and to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, asks a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. 
the water that I give, will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Jesus then, just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it for ourselves. We know that this is truly the Savior of the world. For the word of God in Scripture for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, as we gather here on a bright morning to worship, you and to sing your praises, to lift up our prayers and open our hearts to your word. We are grateful 
for all that you give to us. We are grateful for all that you call us to do and the journey you invite us along. So as we now take in your word, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and you alone our redeemer. And for this, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. So here they are. Jesus and an unnamed woman, a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. A well that had been used for countless generations. A well that had sustained and given life as water is so necessary for that. It's in the middle of the day that Jesus arrives and is thirsty. And it seems that he's waiting, waiting for something, waiting for someone, waiting for a moment. And what should appear at the well but a Samaritan woman coming to get water all by herself. And we hear in the story how Jewish people and Samaritan people had this enmity against each other. They avoided each other. While they had a common moment in history, things had gone bad. And so they didn't talk to each other. They didn't look at each other in the face. They didn't interact. They probably looked down upon each other and maybe had their moments of casting aspersions. And it seems that they would even avoid being in each other's territories. But here's Jesus taking the bold step and going through Samaria to get back to Galilee. Seemingly not concerned about what the history was, what all the memories and rumors and who knows if anybody can remember really the reason why. And was it worth it to not interact with each other? So here Jesus comes into Samaria and comes to the well with a very human need. He's thirsty after walking for a while. And here comes this Samaritan woman, who unfortunately is never named. She too is thirsty or she needs water for cooking, she needs it to sustain herself. But she comes in the middle of the day and some have thought that her appearance in the middle of the day is unusual because normally women who were tasked with gathering the water would go early in the morning, not in the heat of the day. They'd go when it was cooler. And she goes by herself, which would say that her relationship between she and the community of other women has been broken. They choose not to associate with her. Maybe it's, in fact, just easier for her to go by herself in the middle of the day when nobody else is around because of what people have said about her, the impressions they have about her. So here she comes with a very human need. And she comes and in the midst of arriving at the well, she hears someone speak to her. She recognizes him as a Jewish man. And she's shocked that he's even speaking with her, much less asking for some water. And so this conversation ensues. The disciples return. They're even shocked to see that Jesus is breaking these rules of the culture, of the norm of the day, speaking with someone you shouldn't speak with, not only because of the fact 
She's a woman, but she's also a Samaritan. But here, by the end of the story, Jesus has had this conversation about living water and about new life, about a thirst that can be quenched. He has this conversation that moves her. He knows her, and he knows her past, and he knows what it's been all about. Not that it was her fault that she had so many husbands, because back in those days, men could just simply, by law, religious and secular, just declare, I'm going to divorce. So we don't even know if she did anything wrong. We just know this is her life and where her journey has left her. And Jesus comes to her in such a way speaks to her in such a way, it would seem, that in the midst of that conversation, things are revealed. And she, not even being Jewish, sees that this is a savior, her savior. It seems that by the end of the conversation, she's not even worried about filling her water jug and bringing that water back to do the task she needs. She's just wanting to go back and talk to people about her conversation at the well, her encounter with Jesus. And even more so, this woman who wouldn't be heard, who was ignored and shunned and pushed away, moves through that and comes to a place where she makes sure her voice is heard. And so other people listen to her, so much so that they invite Jesus to actually stay with them for a few days. Something so compelling, something so powerful, from two people, from disparate lives and different places, who come together and in this moment become connected by water. And this woman becomes saved, we might say. As we're reading through in our Lenten book study, Diana Butler Bass's book, Freeing Jesus, when she reflects upon the experience of Jesus as a savior, she reminds us that the Latin word for savior means wholeness. Salvation means wholeness, it means healing, it means restoration. While we might limit our thoughts of salvation to that of what makes sure we get to heaven, be assured that Jesus was concerned about what happens here on earth. And in this gospel lesson, and in this point in John's gospel, it's the only time John ever refers to Jesus as Savior, that title, that experience. And while we can take comfort and hold on to our hope that there is something after all of this, and we might be a part of it, There is also something here and now amongst us, within us, in the world, where salvation plays itself out. It's not a final act at the point of death. It's not a who's in and who's out. It's not out of a place of fear and foreboding. You better watch out. You better be on the straight and narrow path, or you're not going to get into heaven. And if you do the other stuff, we definitely know where you're going to go. Salvation isn't about all of that, as far as I can tell by reading this story and thinking about it. Because while I might take comfort in being saved and finding salvation at the end of life, I find there are so many moments of salvation that happen here and now at 
wells like that of Jacob's. Consider this woman who is unnamed. She goes back to living her life and living her community, living in her community. Maybe things never change. Maybe she's still looked at askance. Maybe people still make assumptions about her. She still has perhaps troubles and worries and wonders as a person trying to make it on her own in that day and time. She has her hurts and her pains from her past life. That's what's gone before her. But it seems to me that because of what she experienced at the well, what Jesus said to her and gave to her was a salvific moment. She felt a wholeness. She felt a restoration. She felt a hope that hadn't been there. A hope that actually lightened her so much that she went back and insisted she be heard and made sure she shared it with those around her. And it caught on. Her salvation story in that moment was one that attracted others, drew them into this hope that Jesus brings to us. Like the well that was Jacob's, where Jesus and a Samaritan woman met thousands and thousands of years ago, A group of us met at Brewer's Fountain last Sunday in Boston on the Common. Not a place that you go to get a drink of water. In fact, the fountain was turned off, but definitely a place of gathering, much like a well would be in ancient times. And along with the great diversity of people who were gathered there and working their way through from people to the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Southie, to people having a peace gathering for the Ukraine, to people practicing Tai Chi, to someone selling sausages. Here at that fountain, the place where water bubbles up, was a gathering of unhoused people, a gathering of people who needed food, People who ultimately need shelter and some more security in life. People who gathered with us, who are well-fed and clothed and housed. And here we came together. And we, as people of Bethany, confirmands and family members, went and fed people like Jesus and the Samaritan woman who had a common human need for sustenance. So we all shared in a meal together. We didn't just hand out the food and let the unhoused people eat. We were invited to eat lunches with them too. Peanut butter and jelly and turkey and cheese and ham and cheese and plain old cheese sandwiches. Because... It was an invitation to share in this food together, to not deprive ourselves and just let others eat, even though we probably didn't need it in that moment as much as they did, but rather as an act of solidarity, an act of community, because as the moment and the day went on, it turned out that gathering and that feeding And the worship that happened afterwards was a reminder of how we're all connected. How we're all so similar. We might have our moments, or our brothers and sisters do, where we look askance at someone sitting on a street corner, panhandling for money. We might make a lot of assumptions about them and they of us for not helping. But it seems that in this place, this coming together of disparate groups, we found what we had in common. Hungers that were the same, needs that were similar, 
a common desire to worship together, an ability to share our gifts in leading worship. From Ambrose, one of the members of the community who gave the sermon, no preachers needed, no clergy needed. To us who helped serve communion and offer up prayer requests, to people who have so little and ask for some help, who lift up in their prayers the people of Ukraine and what they're going through, who lift up family and friends who are going through struggles. And so for us who helped to give some juice or a sandwich or to help lead worship, for those of us who appeared, we were part of an unfolding of a moment of salvation. That Jesus, the Savior, was present in that moment and we were embodying what we believe about being a Savior. That it's not just for what happens later, it's for the here and the now. And while we went away and still had our hungers and thirsts and came back to the comfort of the suburbs, those folks who gathered around the fountain, they went back to their lives, wherever it was, on the streets, in a shelter, searching for housing, struggling with addictions and mental illness. But in that moment of togetherness, in that moment of community, something happened. There was something we took from the well, the deep well that God offers. It was some grace and some humility, but it was some courage to continue on. It was eye-opening. It was healing, if only to get them and us, all of us, through the day. It changes. It changes us. When we experience Jesus as Savior, and when we practice and look for and celebrate salvific moments that happen in the ordinary moments of our lives, because they're everywhere. It may not be a major turnaround for our lives or somebody else's. The struggles may still be there, the doubts and the fears and the hurts and the pains. It may still be an up and down road. But we believe and experience a God who comes to us and dwells with us and brings us together offering healness, healing and wholeness, hope and courage in little bits and doses, in small cups and portions. And the good news is, when that cup looks empty, there's a well that is full of water that we can just go back to and never fear that there isn't something to take from it to quench our thirsts and remember that we are all saved. We respond, O oh God, because you are the source of all life and love and being. We call you creator. Because we know the history of your presence among your people, we call you Lord. Because our savior, your obedient child, knew you intimately and spoke of you so, we call you father. Because you are present in the act of birth and because you shelter, nurture, and care for us, we call you mother. Because you hold us up and give us strength and courage when we are weak and in need, we call you sustainer. Because we know beyond pain lies your promise 
of all things made new, we call you hope. Because you are the means of liberation and the way to freedom, we call you Redeemer. Confident that you will hear, we call upon you with all the names that make you real to us, the names that create an image in our minds and hearts, an image that our souls can understand and touch. And yet, we know that you are more than all of these. Blessings and power, glory and honor be unto you, our God. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer this morning, I would invite us to draw together the joys and concerns that are upon our hearts this day, to also draw in those for whom we pray that are on our prayer list. And may we add to that list also Adele French, who uh, had some surgery this week, uh, also to uh, Debbie Mertz, who is recuperating from knee surgery. And so may we take a moment and lift up our prayers to God first in a silent conversation with our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. loving God, we give you thanks for this moment. We give you thanks for your promise to dwell with us. We give you thanks that you promise to give us the water of life that truly quenches all our thirsts that you are the well that we can keep going back to when our cups run empty. When we get thirsty and tired. We give you thanks for your promise of abundance. when it comes to love and grace, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to salvation. For all the moments throughout our lives, where we have found healing and wholeness, where we have found the courage to go on, where we have found redemption and reunion and a deeper connection with someone else or with you, we give you thanks. And we pray you would encourage us and guide us and equip us continue to proclaim you as a savior and to model that and bring that promise to the lives of others. As you gather up the prayers that swirl around in our hearts and minds, the joys and the concerns, the hopes. 
as you gather up prayers for those we care about who are hurting, prayers for nations at war and those who are devastated by the destruction of war. As we lift up our prayers for those who are struggling with illness and injury or recuperating from surgery. May your spirit provide an assurance of your presence, a promise of wholeness, a sense of peace. May our presence be known through you in the gift of food, in the cup of water, in the kind word, in taking the time to connect and have conversation, in the proclamation that you are valued and are full of worth and dignity because you were made by God. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and incline your ear to us and return to us signs and words of your peace. We humbly then offer this prayer along with the silent meditations of our hearts, even as we are bold to pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The call to offering. With thankfulness, we give in gratitude and joy. With prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love. With hopefulness, we give in commitment to God. Spirit burning in the skies, let the hope of your salvation fill our eyes. God of splendor, God of glory, you who light the stars above, all the heavens tell the story of your As you moved upon the waters, as you ride upon the wind, move us all your sons and daughters deep within. As you shaped the hills and mountains, formed the land and filled the deep, let your hand renew and wake it all. Oh, no. 
Love that sends the rivers dancing, love that waters all that lives, love that heals and holds and rouses and forgives. You are food for all your creatures, you are hunger in the soul. In your hands the broken-hearted are made whole. Spirit renewing the earth, renewing the hearts of all people. Burn in the weary souls, blow through the silent lips. Dear God, we offer you our praise. We offer you our hearts. We offer you our money. We offer you our lives. Thank you for everything you give to us. Amen. to our parting on this day and I'm going to invite Lorna up first to offer an announcement about the spring thing. Good morning. Good morning. 
it's less than a week away. It's this Saturday, April 2nd at 6.30 in Fellowship Hall and the gym. It's the spring thing, and if you don't have a ticket, we don't really have tickets, but if you haven't purchased the right to come, um, please see me after coffee hour or during coffee hour, and um, we can hook you up. So hope to see everybody there on Saturday night. We come into a busier season in the church year and in the life of Bethany with the second offering of a concert by the Naponsa Choral Society this afternoon, hence the risers, uh, and then the spring thing next Saturday, and then a few other things coming up that um, you'll hear more about and may have heard if you uh, read the weekly e-blast, but on April 9th, we're going to be having a pancake breakfast here in the Fellowship Hall, and what we really could use is some volunteers to make this happen. There's a sign-up sheet out in the narthex, there's one on the bulletin board by the elevator, there's even one downstairs. Uh, it's from 7 to 9.30, it's $5 a person, all you can eat, and all of the proceeds from this breakfast will go to towards relief efforts for the people of Ukraine. So please spread the word, come yourself, invite your family and friends. Uh, it's a great community event and fellowship event and also getting people together as we haven't been able to for so long. Another opportunity when we get into Holy Week, which begins on April 10th with Palm Sunday. On Monday, Thursday, when we remember the Lord's Supper in the upper room with his disciples, we're going to do things a little different in terms of the format. We're going to invite people who are able to come at 6 p.m., and we're going to have a simple soup supper down in the fellowship hall. Uh, at the conclusion of that supper, there we will remember the Last Supper and celebrate worshipfully down there. And then at 7.30, we will gather up here for a service of tenebrae, of shadowing, like Jesus went into the garden to pray, and during that time, the disciples betrayed and abandoned him. We will remember that part of the story. So if you'd like to, and we hope you can, come to the Simple Soup Supper at 6 p.m. in that portion. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet as well in those places to let us know you're coming so we have enough food. Um, and if you can make both portions, that is wonderful. If you can only make one part, that is also well, wonderful, and you are welcome at either one or both. So with those announcements made, um, and others you might read about in the service order today, and you might talk about in coffee hour in a few moments, let us now uh, stand in body or spirit and prepare ourselves to leave this sacred time. As we extinguish the candles and we change the light, I invite us to notice the fullness of having been filled with the water of everlasting life. Take that fullness with you. Offer someone else a drink. Hmm. And so siblings in Christ, let us go out into the world in peace, strong with good courage, lifting the faint apart and supporting the weak, holding fast to that which is good, resisting that which is evil, giving thanks in all circumstances and praying constantly, knowing most of all that the God who we worship here today is the God who goes with us through these doors and out into our week ahead. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us, now and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And let us share words and signs of peace with one another this day. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and on
万事如